Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this afternoon's webinar on ArcGIS Quick Capture. Uh, this is the second second uh, webinar of our field apps series, uh, focusing on ArcGIS Quick Capture. Last week we focused on Survey One Two Three, and then next week we'll be looking at field maps. Um, in case you didn't uh, join us last week, just very quickly by way of introduction, my name is Jacob Lovejoy. I'm a registered teacher in Queensland uh, and currently work as the education program manager at Esri Australia, where my job is to support schools, teachers and students in their adoption and engagement uh, with ArcGIS and the various applications that are available to us. Um, at any time, if you'd ever need to reach me, you can reach out to education at esriaustralia.com.au and I'd be more than happy to help. If you are looking to, uh, I guess, access this presentation or at least the story map afterwards, uh, here is the URL uh, for this whole presentation. Um, it's got a couple of videos, um, a map, some other images and whatnot, um, but they'll be at the end as well. And I'll reshare that at the end and point it out for you. Uh, if you have any questions during today's webinar, you can engage with me via the question box. Simply type in your question and hit send, and I will keep an eye on it throughout, but probably only really check it every 10 or so minutes, um, just to, so that we get kind of a flow going. Um, otherwise, let's jump straight into it. I think the most appealing thing about this particular application is uh, the user interface. As you can see, uh, I think it might, yeah, as you can see here, you know, it's a really simple press a button kind of in, interface. And, and that's really great for for any year level, even um, I think there's a, there's a really good argument for even primary school teachers getting involved in, in this. Um, but particularly those junior grades, this is a really friendly way to collect data too. So some of its main features just uh, running through um, and I guess recapping on what the video shared. It's a form-based data collection tool. So you can see the forms here, nice and simple forms. And it's an, it has an intuitive interface. It's easy for teachers to build once you know how and share with your class. And it's easy for all year levels to use. Uh, as you can see, again, by the image it has smartphone we have a smartphone app application for it. It's free to download, and all you need is your ArcGIS login credentials. This goes for students too. Uh, create the data collection form on a laptop, which is the process we'll be going through today, and then you collect the data on a mobile or a tablet form. And again, as mentioned in the video, you can collect data offline. So if you don't have access to the internet or you don't have a mobile service, that's all right. You can still, your, your mobile still, uh, I guess, picks up a GPS signal uh, and you can still map data uh, to the app. And then the next time you're uh, connected to the internet and you open the application back up, it'll ask you whether you want to send that data um, to your ArcGIS online account and essentially map it for you. Uh, because we're, we're running with a, th a three week series, I thought it's it would be good to mention why would I, use quick capture over survey one two three if you were here last week survey one two three is a great field application to support collecting detailed data about a singular location and the example i've got here is if we're collecting data on water quality at a specific site or specific locations along a local river for instance ph uh, water turbidity pollution salinity levels etc uh, quick capture is more of a useful tool for collecting a large range of data across larger areas, but at a less detailed level. So we do have the ability with these buttons to be able to add a notes feature where we can click the button to mark bridge, for instance, and then make a quick note about that bridge. But we can't really um, build an in-depth form like Survey123 to know everything about that bridge. Uh, so Again, the example, if, if we were to go out into the park, and this is the context we'll work with in today's webinar, and map uh, the location of park services and amenities or general land use in, in a public park, for instance, that 
quick capture would be the better tool for the job. So with that in mind, why would I use it? it can be, data can be mapped to any location, even without the internet. The great and probably best draw card of quick capture is we can create our own feature layers specific to our classroom or assessment needs. So if I need to create a certain um, set of point data, a certain set of line data, a certain set of polygon data, I can do that. And I'm not restricted by uh, templates that might exist elsewhere. So I can get really down nitty gritty with what I need to, com to, to complete the task at hand. Student buy-in is um, a huge factor with quick capture. I think even more so than survey one, two, three. You know, you get these nice little uh, images and symbols on um, the form. Uh, and it's it's a simple touch of a button. It's really, really user-friendly. And I think, um, yeah, you, it's great for student buy-in, particularly in the younger years of high school um, and primary school. Uh, it's interactive and simple to use. And this is something that I forgot to mention last week in the Survey123 um, webinar. But, you know, we're putting, by using this kind of geospatial technology, we're putting that silent G for geography back in STEM. I always like to think it goes after the E, Stegum, but that's just me. Um, but, but again, yeah, that, that idea of making the subject more academic, more rigorous, more challenging, and hopefully as a result, um, getting, getting those academic students that might have chosen physics or chemistry you know, considering this subject and maybe hanging around in senior school. And lastly, curriculum, of course, mandates the use of geospatial technology. So when should I start? As I was kind of uh, mentioning before, I think primary school teachers, this is right up um, primary school teachers alley for, for you guys to use and collect data around the school. Um, otherwise, in, in year 12, uh, sorry, in senior school, we can start right from year seven again. Seven again, that place and livability unit really lends a hand uh, to a lot of these fieldwork applications. Uh, so quick capture would be great for, the, for, for that unit too. Uh, otherwise, let's head over to ArcGIS Online, which is where we need to start with quick capture. I'm gonna show you uh, the process of creating the feature layers we will essentially use when we go to create our quick capture form. So I'm just going to head over here, which is my ArcGIS Online account, and it might look a little bit different to yours. Um, you'll probably have a different home screen than me, or you will, sorry. And from here, I'm going to head over to content. And you can create these feature layers. I'm assuming that some of the names I see in um, this webinar may may create some of their feature layers via ArcGIS Pro. Um, but the great thing about ArcGIS Online is there's very little reason that we teachers need to go to ArcGIS Pro. Um, we can create our own feature layers in here, which is absolutely awesome. So from here, you know, there's two buttons in the top left corner, Add Item and Create. And I want to click on Create. And our first option is Feature Layer. We want to click on Feature Layer. And from here, we get a range of templates, and I'm not too interested in templates. Maybe if I was um, doing bridge inventory, this would be useful, but I want to build my layer from scratch. So I'm going to, over on the left-hand side, click Build a Layer. And this is where you would need to consider, okay, what does my classroom task or my assessment task require students to map? If it was just point data, then I'll just click on points, same with lines and polygons. However, if I'm considering I need to use all three, or maybe not all three, I might just want points and lines, I could still create this and kind of just ignore the third one I didn't need. Alternatively, you could create your points layer and your lines layer separately. For the context today, we're gonna to be building a form to, to map park amenities, so things like barbecues, picnic tables, which is point data, but we're also gonna be mapping um, paths in the park, which is where our lines come in, and then also land use in the park. So is there paved courts? Is there a car park? Um, is there a dog park, etc. And because I'm mapping all three types, I'm gonna choose points, lines, and polygons, and I'm going to click create. And here, before I click next, I'm just gonna rename these 
to what I am actually mapping. So if, instead of point, I'm going to change that to park amenities. Instead of line, I'm going to change that to park paths. And for polygon layer, I'm going to change that to park land use. I click out of it just to lock them in. I don't, uh, you don't need to touch these. And we're going to click next. Set your map extent. So if you knew you were only going to be collecting data at a very local level, something like this um, is a perfect example of that. I might zoom in to a specific uh, park or region in Brisbane. I might just leave it at that. And when I'm happy with my map extent, click next. You don't have to set a map extent either. The data will still be mapped regardless. Uh, I'm just going to enter a quick uh, title and tags. Um, Quick capture, webinar, park services. I'm going to leave the tags as is, um, and I'm going to hit done. And of course, I should know this by now. I cannot have special characters, so I will remove the uh, hyphen and then try again. Um, what, what happens, I had a question just there, what happens if I click the GPS button? I think um, the reason you would select that is if you had a GPS receiver that was um, tied to your mobile phone, or sorry, not tied, that paired with your mobile phone or your um, iPad. So a GPS receiver, I'm not sure how much they are. I know they vary in cost, but a mobile device or an iPad probably has a GPS accuracy in, in a clear space, so not a built up area or not an area with trees overhead, in a clear space probably has a resting GPS accuracy of about five to seven meters. Whereas if you buy a GPS um, uh, receiver and you pair it to your device, depending on the quality of that receiver, you might get a receiver that's that improves your GPS accuracy to within 30 centimeters. I think some of them are. So I would I would consider clicking that if I had access to that. Um, but I would have to read up on that. And I'm assuming that most schools don't have access to that kind of stuff. But if you do, um, reach out to me and I can I can read up on that for you and explain that a bit better. But essentially, on this screen, uh, we have our item page, and we can see our three feature layers that have been created here. From here, we're just on an overview. I want to actually head over to data because I've got a little bit more work to do with my feature layers um, so that they are a little bit more specific with the data we're collecting. At the moment, you'll, you'll see that this is on the table tab. And because we haven't collected any data, that table appears empty. But if we click over to fields, we have... Um, we want to add a couple of fields to here to, to specify some of the, the data in our feature classes. So we'll see my three layers up the top here. I'm going to start with my points layer, park amenities. I want to actually create a new field because I need to be able to differentiate between the types of amenities in the field or in the park. So for field name, I'm going to write, um, what am I going to write? Park amenities. And I'm not going to um, space it out. Field names cannot have a space between it, but that's all right. No one sees that. The display name is what your students will see. So I can essentially write the same thing twice, but space it out this time. And I don't want to choose string. I'll, sh I'll get to string in a second, but I want to choose integer for this. And I'm going to accept these values as they are, and I'm going to hit add new field. And you'll now see that my new field has been uh, added in, in here. I want to click on that, and I'm going to create a list on the right-hand side. And this is where I can get specific with the types of amenities I want my students to map. So for instance, in this one, you can see that I've done a bit of a test. I'm going to put bubblers or water bubblers, and I'm going to give it a code of zero. And an inter because we chose integer, it just means that we have to give everything a whole number as a value, um, which essentially just maps, uh, not maps, um, codes to the back end of the buttons that they will press on uh, the form. 
So bubblers, uh, picnic tables and benches. Whoops, did I spell that? I did spell that right. One. Um, restrooms. Two. And waste bin. Three. Now you can imagine if if we weren't constricted by time, or if you were um, setting out your own specific uh, feature layer or amenities, this list could go for 10 to 12. Um, but for today's purpose, these four will do. Um, you get the hopefully you get the process of um, essentially creating a list of the types of amenities that you would expect students to see and map in um, a public park. So I might have also included uh, recycling bin, um, park gym, maybe uh, barbecue, things like that as well. But for today, that list is going to be okay. And I'm going to hit save. And I need to return to the fields view. So I'm just going to cross out of my list here. And I've returned to this fields view. Now we want to add a second field. And I mentioned that we could make brief notes on our quick capture form. So we're going to label this one notes. And this is where we want to leave it as string. So we can kind of see string. We probably associate this 256 characters with something like Twitter. Um, but by leaving it as string, it allows our students to enter some notes. Um, 256 characters worth of notes. Now, there's no reason I couldn't change that to a thousand, but we want to be quick and agile in uh, the field. So I want my notes or any notes that students do make to be brief and to the point. 256 is more than enough. Realistically, 100, if we split that in half, that would still be more than enough. Um, but we hit add new field. And we can see that that's been added to the fields list for this park amenities layer. Do we need to click on that and create a list? No, not this time. We only need to create a list for when we want to different, differentiate between um, a specific thing like park amenities. Notes, having this in the, in the feature layers fields will allow us to make a note against any of these park amenities too. So if I was mapping um, the barbecue, and I wanted to make a note that the last person didn't clean it or the, it's out of gas, I can make that. But I could also make a note for parks and benches, um, you know, wood has rotted or nail protruding from underside of, of table, for instance. Uh, I do have a question. Um, sorry, let me find it. Uh, is there a trick to the audio? I can't hear anything. This is probably not going to help you um, <laughs> because you won't be able to hear my response. But if you can, um, or if you're just having some difficulties, it'll most likely be on your side of the laptop. Um, you just need to check your computer settings. I'm sorry, I can't help you further. Um, continuing on. So we've added the fields we wanted for park amenities. You would do the same for your lines and your polygons layer. And I'm going to fly through these because I'm really aware of time. But for park, uh, path, sorry, I'm going to add a new one, um, path type. I'm going to change it to integer again, add new field. And when I find that, I'm going to create a list and let's just go with three. Um, what have we got? Footpath, probably a good one to start with, zero. Uh, second one, we'll go with bicycle path Oops. with a value of one. And hey, depending on the kind of path we're, oh, this kind of park we're in, there might be trails as well. I'm going to save that and cross out of that field. And that's complete there. And lastly, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm not going to add notes for these two just because we are running on time constraints this afternoon. Um, type land use. And I like to capitalize my words here so I can see the field name a bit more clearly. Type of land use uh, integer because I'm going to be creating another list. And 
click on that list, sorry. I'll click on that field, sorry, to create the list and we'll just go with another three. Paved court, which I have prepared. Dog park. And we might go grassed areas. You might want to differentiate if you're doing something like this. You might, there's a difference in my eyes between grassed areas and ovals, um, but that'll do for today. But hopefully this has just reinforced uh, what you need to be doing when you are building those fields and those lists, because without those lists, um, your data form in Quick Capture will not display the different uh, park amenities. So it wouldn't display barbecue, uh, picnic tables, waste bins. It would just come up as uh, park amenities with one button. You wouldn't be able to differentiate. So it's really important that you create those lists by adding a new field. So now that we've added those lists, we want to head back to overview. And I always like to double check. It's on by default. But if I click on one of my layers, just want to make sure on the right hand side that enable attachments is turned on because that will allow my students to take photos in the field as well. In the video we saw a lady taking photos of trees. Um, if that was turned off we're not able to um, take photos in the first place but it will also remove existing attachments. So it's important that we just double check that that's on and then we just hit the back button up on the blue pane and you could check for all three but it is on by default. Um, it used to be off by default, which I guess is why I'm in the habit of checking. Um, but yeah, it's always worth a check. And then from here, we're nearly at the stage where we're going over to Quick Capture, but I want to symbolize my new lists that I've created. So I'm actually going to open this feature layer in a map, and I'm going to symbolize uh, each of the shapes. So under content, we'll notice that our three layers appear and it's a little bit confusing. I like to rename them and get rid of the first part, which is the name of the overall layer and just like to reduce it to a name where it's clear as to what the data is showing. So park paths, park land use and park amenities. And from there, it's a really quite easy to identify what's, what is points, what is lines, and what is polygons. Um, but if I hover over park amenities, I'm gonna choose the shapes icon, which is the change style tool. And I'm gonna swap the attribute over from show location only to that new field I created before, park amenities, which will have my list in it. And you can see my list appears here. And if I was happy with those colors, I could leave it as is. If I'm not happy with the colors, I could actually go into options and click on each of these um, colors once at a time. So for bubblers, and go from fill to shape, and I could actually find uh, a better a better uh, symbol for it. So I think for, sh for this particular one, if I remember uh, correctly, if we go to, I think it's government. Um, there's so many, but government is, is usually bet the best. Or, But there we go, like a water, if I'm talking about bubblers, might make it a bit bigger so we can see, but there's a water symbol. And I would repeat, I'm not going to because it takes time to find these symbols, but I would repeat um, that for each of my amenities if I was a little bit more um, specific as to what I wanted my map to look like. And it's really important that once you've uh, finished changing them all, you would hit OK and you would hit Done to lock it in. Um, same with the park paths. You need to make sure you, you move it from show location only to path type, which is that new field we created. And you can, again, if you're not happy with the colors, you can go into options and change those lines. As they are lines, you're not gonna find symbols for them. Um, I think that lines and areas are usually good to stick stick as they are. Um, I'm pretty happy with this. You know, If anything reminds me of nature, trail is, so I think green's appropriate for it. I'm gonna leave that as it is, and hit okay and hit done, and then I'm gonna repeat that step for park land use. Again, changing the attribute to the new one I created, type of land use. 
and I'm not happy with that. Why would, you know, for instance, why would grassed areas be blue? I would actually, just for the sake of my students collecting the data, I would make those changes. Paved courts probably more likely to be blue. Um, but if, you know, you might stay away from blue altogether. Blue can, can represent water. So just making those changes and hitting OK and hitting done to lock them in. Um, cool, I did, thought I saw hands up before, um, but it seems to, have been, seems to have disappeared, so I'll continue. Now, you can see that legend, now that I've uh, set what attribute I want to show and I've set the legend, it now appears in our legend box as well. But I want to go a step further and I actually want to save those symbols changes to the feature layers themselves. So if I head over to edit, and the edit button's not always um, there. So if I turned all these feature layers off, you'll notice the edit button disappears. To keep them, or to be able to use the edit button, your feature layers need to be on. But if I head over to edit, I actually wanna save these symbols so that they're the same regardless of whatever map they're in. So I'm gonna hit manage at the bottom here. And I'm gonna check what um, layer is selected. So it's my points layer at the moment. And I'm gonna save those changes to the feature layer itself. And I'm gonna repeat the steps for park paths and park land use. Now, I mean, regardless of whatever map I decide to put this into, or if I wanna use this feature layer, uh, these feature layers for another purpose or another topic, those symbols will be the same. I, otherwise, if you don't set those symbols, it's gonna you're gonna have to do it essentially for every map you create. So I think it's a really good um, thing to do. And if you don't um, set your symbols here, then when you go over to your quick capture form, you're just gonna have boring uh, red dots or colors that might not mean too much. So it's worth setting uh, setting your symbols in here. And just because I do want to view this as a map later on. I'm going to save the feature. I'm going to save the map that I've just opened too. So, par, uh, public park amenities, and I'm just chucking in a random tab. Uh, sorry, tag and hitting save. So from there, we have created our feature layers. Just to recap, we've created our feature layers and we've um, symbolized each of them and then saved those changes and saved a map. So now we're ready to head over to ArcGIS Quip, Quick Capture um, and start building that form. If you do have a question um, burning in your brain right now, it might be a good time to ask it before I do move on to the next section. So whilst I'm waiting for you to do that, if you did have one, I can access Quick Capture by either Googling it or hitting this nine digit widget and it should be there down the bottom, quick capture. And I'll just check, make sure that no questions came through. Awesome, we will continue on. Okay, so from here, your projects, and if you didn't have one, sorry, I did just get a question. Uh, is the add new type of feature a quick way of adding features if you've forgotten them in the original code. Um, yeah, I believe that was, did that come up in the map just before? Sorry, there we go. Yes, yes it is. Um, so if I was to click on this, I could create some more, um, which is, it's nice knowing that you don't have to necessarily go back in and create the list from scratch. Um, or add to that list through the back end like we did before. Um, but my advice would be when you are planning your lists and, and whatnot, the best thing to do is always sit down and, and plan on a piece of paper or in a Word document anyway um, before you get going with the technology. It's always nice to have a plan on paper of exactly what you want your students to collect. Um, otherwise, yeah, I think the first time I built something like this, I missed three or four things that I wanted. And that was after I sat there in front of this technology for a while, considering what I needed. Um, but yeah, that's one way of doing it. Um, 
So once we've had it headed over to Quick Capture, yours might look empty at the moment because you haven't created any forms. That's all right. This is me just practicing in the past, making sure I know what I'm doing for today's webinar. But you would just simply head up to the top right and hit New Project. And we want to start from existing layers. We could, if you didn't want to create um, your own feature layers, you can start from a template, but I think you will find really quickly that working within someone else's template is severely limiting um, because it's almost guaranteed that the, the data that they're trying to collect is going to be different from what you need. So either it might be similar, but it's going to omit things or uh, have added things that you don't want collected. So my advice is definitely create your own feature layers and start from those existing feature layers. And you'll notice this is a list of feature layers that I've created. Some of them are surveys because surveys technically are feature layers, but this is the one that I just created. Um, and if you do know the, the title of it, you can simply search for it as well. But I'm gonna click on this one and it's gonna ask me, do I wanna create buttons from layer symbology? Yes, I do. I spent time in the map creating some symbologies. Um, so yes, I wanna use that. And I'm going to hit next. Um, create a title for it. Make sure your email is correct so that you can recover the project if you need to. And save in an appropriate folder in ArcGIS Online. So by saving it in the root folder, it'll just save in um, where all your content is saved. So my root folder in ArcGIS Online is J Lovejoy at GIS for Schools, but I could save it in a specific folder too. And I'm going to hit create. And from here, we can see our form in the middle, and there's a couple of things we'll have to do to it to make it a li little bit more uh, pretty. You can see that because I only um, set symbology for bubblers, the other three amenities have just appeared as the colors that they were in ArcGIS Online. So yeah, I think again, spending the time symbolizing your your uh, layers, particularly your point layers, um, makes it look so much nicer. But this is our form. I can view how the form will look on different types of devices. As a general rule, I just go off the idea that most or the majority of the student population slash the world is on an iPhone. Um, and I set it at iPhone 6, 7, 8 because they're the smallest screens. So by keeping it on 6, 7, and 8, I can see what, hey, even if you've got an outdated iPhone, this is what it'll look like. The bigger screens like the iPhone 11, well, you're just going to have extra room at the bottom of the form, which is fine. Um, but you're never going to get a form that f is a one size fit all. So just work out how you think your students will be collecting data and, and have that displayed as the, the view. If you're going to be using school iPads, then, you know, select the, the relevant iPad. But otherwise, from here, I want to make my form a little bit more user friendly, have a better user experience. So if I click on one of the buttons, it'll bring up a range of options on the side and I can change the text if I needed to. So actually a good example would when I would need to change the text is something like this. Picnic tables and B inches. Doesn't quite fit. So I might actually just reduce it to picnic tables or I could maybe try, no. So the spacing will not start a new line. I might just stick with picnic tables to make it a little bit, a little bit neater. But if I head over back to bubblers, I can choose the size of an icon. I like to go with the smallest because that means more can fit on my screen. I can do little things like make them rounded corners or sharp corners. I can put a fill in if I want, so a different background color. And I can put a nice strong border around it too. I'm a big fan of the borders. Um, but again, it's pretty obvious what's a button and what's not. So that's personal preference. Um, you shouldn't have an issue with your image. Um, so your 
your symbology being too big if you set the symbology size in ArcGIS Online at an appropriate um, size. If you go with 108, then it might not fit on the button, but something like 25 is gonna be fine. And this, I think, was 22 from memory. Um, so I can set how my the appearance of the buttons look on, on this tab, and then if I head over to the Data tab, I can also say, hey, I want you to take a photo of each amenity or each water bubbler that you take. I turn that on and you'll see the little camera icon appear at the top left of the button. And I could make it required or I might not actually, it might just give them the option. So if they were to press the button and it wasn't required, it would say something like, did you want to take a photo? If I had it on, I'm pretty sure that when you click the button, it'll open up the camera view straight away. Um, so that's up to you. I guess it could be fairly time consuming if you're having to take a photo of everything, if that's not really the purpose of your field work. Um, for something like this, it might only be that I want photos of uh, amenities that are damaged in some way that need replacing if I was a council worker, for instance. Uh, Again, personal preference, do you want them to have a, I guess, a um, they take the photo and, and an image shows up for them to go, yep, that was a good photo, tick, or no, once they take the photo, it returns them to the form. By clicking hide camera preview, you don't even get to see the camera open up. You would point your phone at the water bubbler, and as you press the button to map it, it would also take a photo. So that would be really important to consider if you if you don't want your students even accessing the camera. You just need to make sure they're pointing their device at the relevant thing they're mapping at the same time. Uh, if I have a question here, if a student phone reaches capacity while they are using it, can they turn off photos and continue with just points? That's a a good uh, a good question, and that's probably why. Um, you can't if if it was required it's gonna make it's gonna ask them to take a photo so that's I guess where this comes in you need to consider either telling your students beforehand to plan and photo dump their photos onto something like their their laptop at home or you might unselect that um, but at the same time if you're connected to the internet the photos will actually attach to the feature layer um, rather than on their phone. So just depends. Most phones are pretty big now anyway, that that, that probably won't be an issue. Um, you'll, you'll remember that I created a notes field for these point layers too. So this is where I can set that, and this it gets a bit tricky um, from memory. So just important that you pay attention, don't just leave this as is, you still have to set it. So I need to click on this and I need to change it from fixed value to button user input. And then I need to collect, uh, sorry, select, select user input and create new. And for label, I'm gonna write, uh, did you want to make some notes? So when this, when a student clicks on this button, bubblers, this question will appear to them. And, oh, sorry, actually, you know what? I'm gonna go with notes here because I've just noticed that we can apply a hint and I could add some more information here, make some notes about this amenity, but it might be optional. If I don't want it to be optional, I want them to make notes, it's required, but I would, my advice would be to leave this unticked because you probably don't need to make notes about every single thing, um, but that's up to you. So required or not required, otherwise when, when we're happy with the button user input, we're gonna hit create. And for that particular button, you can take photos and you can also make notes. Unfortunately, this is where I will say you can't just um, select all of these at once and do the same thing for each of them. It'll, it is a little bit time consuming in that you have to click on the next button, set the appearance, set the data um, settings. So turn on the photos, turn the, the uh, notes on. Um, yeah, there's no like apply all, I guess. 
So you have to do that for each one. So something like bicycle paths, I might shorten that to bike paths just so it fits on one line. Same with grassed areas and paved courts, finding a way to shorten it um, so it looks a little bit more user-friendly, um, looks a little bit more appealing to the eye. But essentially you create your form, uh, you set the data settings and the appearance settings, and then once you're happy with it, you save it and you share it. Uh, this update can now be down downloaded in the mobile app. It says that there's a couple of warnings on the side. I can check them out. And when I read these warnings, there's something that I can dismiss anyway. I haven't put in a description for this project and I haven't shared it with anyone. Well, I'm going to solve one of them. And this one, I don't care too much about for today. But if you were using this, building this for an assessment task, you might want to put in a description when you created um, the form. But I'm going to share. And I do want to point out that you can't share with everyone for quick capture. You can only share well, between yourself or your organization, which is your school. Um, it just requires, by not being able to share with everyone, it means that when students open the Quick Capture app on their phone or on an iPad, it's going to prompt them to log in, which is fine when they have their own ArcGIS uh, login credentials, but we can't share with everyone. And I'm not sure why that decision is, but uh, that is the decision. And then you can share with your students by getting them to open up the Quick Capture app on their phone and there'll be a scan QR code button on that app. And they just point it at that and it will ask them whether they want to download it to their phone. So you can either do that at school or again, if students are a bit protective over how they're using their data when they're not on Wi-Fi, um, you could send that in an email, snipping tool that out and send it in an email and set it for homework for them to do at home and download at home. Um, but otherwise, that's uh, how you essentially create a form. Now, if I return to my story map, once that's on, on their application, you're ready to go. Um, once it's on their mobile or their iPad, you're ready to go in the field. Um, if I return here for a second, unfortunately, I can't demonstrate the uh, data collection process because we're speaking virtually uh, in a webinar. But that video at the start, that two minute video that I showed right at the beginning, you saw that even this image, you see that really the process is nothing more than um, pressing buttons. You press a button and if you've turned on camera, it'll prompt you to take a photo. If you've turned on a notes, it'll prompt you, did you want to take a note? and that'll depend on whether it's requ required or not. Um, and then it'll return to, to this view here and you continue on your merry way and find the next point, line or polygon that you need to map. Same with lines um, and polygons. Um, you press it once. If I was walking the, the circumference of an oval, and this is where I'll show you, this is one I spent too long in a park near home doing this. Um, it was a hot day too, but I walked the, I, I started here on the oval, on the grassed area. I clicked once on the grassed area button and then I walked around the perimeter of this shape. And when I got back to the starting spot, I clicked that button again um, to, to lock in that polygon. And the button will flash on and off, on and off as you walk. So you know that the button is on and that it's mapping. And then when you get back to your, uh, the starting spot or to the finish spot, you click it again to stop it. It's the same with um, walking a path. You click it, you press the button once at the start of the path, you walk the path, and then you press the button again to stop it. And you can, I can't remember who asked the question about GPS accuracy, but you can see that the path is pretty smooth through the open area. And then when I get to this bit of tree cover, it gets a bit jagged. Um, Fairly sure that's not the path, that's probably more the tree cover is impeding the GPS accuracy a little bit, so it's it, it becomes a bit jagged. Um, but essentially this is the end result. So I put in a map here for you to see what it looks like, and I've got my legend here. So this is one I did earlier, but I've gone around a park and I've mapped all the water bubblers, the restrooms, there was a park, a gym at this one. 
So if I move over here, I had two park gyms here, um, a playground because I couldn't find a better symbol to use, waste bin, picnic table. Um, the blue was footpaths. If I scroll down to fields, courts and open spaces, so the type of land use in this park, we've got grassed areas, but we've also got ovals. So these are netball courts, but they're on grass. They're grassed courts, so I, I classified that as an oval. But then we've also got paved courts too, um, which turned uh, is purple. Got the car park there. A bike path runs through that area. We've got a dog park and another path out to the residential area. So we can see that there are some, you know, it's not nice and sharp corners, and that's not a reflection of the application, that's a reflection of my mobile's GPS accuracy as well. So it's pretty good still, um, and it's definitely should be good enough for, for assessment. Um, but if I wanted to, I could actually go back into the map that I saved in ArcGIS Online and I could click on this shape and it would ask me whether I wanted to edit it. And I could actually drag the corners or the sides out a little bit to um, just make it a bit neater. So I could drag this side out so it's meeting the edge of the quartz if I wasn't happy with it. So I can clean it up a little bit, um, but it won't be perfect unless you have a really good uh, GPS signal or GPS receiver. But I think the, the important thing is knowing that you can go back into the map at the end, click on a polygon or a point and drag it to a desired location. Um, I have a question. Uh, can students enter point data while they are in the process of walking the line or just the line only? Good question, you can. So if I was walking this line and I wanted to map, oh sorry, this path and I wanted to map every time there was a pothole in the path, which is point data, I just turn the line on and as I walk, I can click on the pothole button um, every time I come across one uh, and that's fine. Um, I don't know if you can do it for polygon and uh, for an area and a line. Um, I'm not sure about that one. I'll actually have to go and test that in the field. Um, but I don't know if that's something that you would be doing anyway. Hopefully that answers your question. Um, otherwise, that uh, this is essentially the end result. And hopefully you can see that hopefully you've got you've got some kind of project in mind at your school or assessment task or classroom activity where you're going, oh, this would be a really good tool to engage my students. Um, with that task or with that assessment piece. Um, and the data is pretty accurate at the end of the day uh, and, and is quite impressive for a school student to include in, on something like um, a senior assessment piece because uh, they've created this map essentially themselves. Um, otherwise, if you did have questions, we've got about eight minutes. Um, it is question and answer time. so. Can you please, please, if you do, chuck them in on the side? Otherwise, I do want to, again, reiterate, here it is, sorry, looking for it, that if you wanted to grab this story map and, and run with it uh, to your colleagues or to, to review it at a later date, just copy that URL in um, somewhere safe and um, you'll be able to access everything in this story map to, to review. Uh, otherwise, I will point out our GIS for Schools page under the PD tab. We've got quick capture here. There's two videos. So I've split pretty much what we've gone through today into two, uh, I think they're about 15 minute videos, or you can just access the how to PDF document. Um, but I'm pretty sure it uses the same example, that parks example but you can review that there again. My last um, little bit of information that I was hoping to ask some, some of you, especially now that you're all uh, seasoned Survey123 experts, is if you could uh, spend some time pointing your phone, your phone camera at this QR code uh, and filling out my feedback survey. I promise it's not gonna be used for marketing to you or anything like that, but we do, I do run a fair few webinars um, 
each term and it's great to know what teachers are after. So if you've got some ideas as to, hey, I'd really want some support on this particular application or with you know, this particular um, context or assessment piece, how could I potentially use uh, GIS? Um, by filling out that feedback form, that feedback survey, you can help inform those, those decisions on what future webinar topics, learning materials, PD resources, et cetera, will be. And there's also a, an option, a, a question there, I think it's just a yes, no. Um, that asks whether you would want you want me to contact you, and if if you know you're you're asking for some one-on-one -on -one support or need some extra help by filling out that survey and just ticking yes to that, I'll, I'll make sure I get in contact uh, with you. Otherwise, next week is our final webinar of the Field Apps series, uh, which is on field maps. Uh, and my encouragement would be again, if you haven't and you're interested in seeing what Field Maps is about, uh, definitely a chance to, uh, sorry, definitely recommend you you um, register for that. Field Maps is kind of the combination of Survey123 and Quick Capture into one. Um, and last week we were talking about that being used at a senior level, 11s and 12s in particular, um, but it combines the best the best features of Servo123 with the best features of Quick Capture, um, and it's all in one app. So we'll be we'll be culminating the webinar series with field maps next week. Um, if you've copied the story map down, you can register there. Otherwise, you can also register on the PD page. That brings us to an end uh, of today's webinar. Again, thank you for your time. Thank you for sacrificing uh, your time after school. Uh, it's really appreciated. And if you did have any questions, again, feel free to reach out to me or access that survey. Um, otherwise, have a great afternoon. Thank you, everybody.